from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, good evening, guys. Thanks for making it out. We're, uh, we're up now with our uh, penultimate act for the night. Uh, my name is Michael Kavna, columnist, cartoonist with the Washington Post, and I write the daily comic riffs blog and also uh, did the syndicated strip Warp. You can find it at gocomics.com. It is my true pleasure uh, to bring, a, bring a, an artist here, who a graphic novelist who is just amazing, one of the true rising stars in, in comics. Uh, Mr. Ed Pisker, he, he was self-taught, and he was vibing out to two things that, that uh, in 70s and 80s culture, throwing back. One was Marvel Comics, uh, people like Jack Kirby, this brilliant style, and the other was hip hop. And so he has taken these twin passions and married them beautifully. Uh, he got his big break working with the great Harvey P. Carr, who, who liked his style, liked what he did, and they collaborated. He worked, worked on American Splendor, and the Beats and Macedonia. And he had his great book on a graphic novel about hacking called the WYSIWYG, but he had a vision. He wanted to do this thing, not one book. Uh, and so he began doing hip hop, telling the true history of hip hop. Uh, and Ed works like a true journalist, a true researcher, a true historian. And he does these beautifully and he does it in that awesome 70s Marvel aesthetic and it's just the coolest thing. Uh, and so, this year, we got Hip Hop, Family Tree, Book Four. We're getting to the 80s, we're getting to Dre, we're getting to Will Smith, and they're gonna keep coming, uh, and beautifully, and I just, you know, I know he'll continue to show that dedication. Let's hope we see it in other forms. Let's hope we see it on the screen. Uh, and moderating with him tonight will be uh, Damon Locks, Chicago-based visual artist, musician, not only does he cool, cool projects uh, of many kinds, but he works with Unheard Music of the Sun Ra Archive and uh, puts it to animation. And he also has worked with the Stateville Correctional Facility. He's a man of just many talents who spreads creativity in many forms. It is my true pleasure to welcome to the stage Mr. Ed Piscor and Mr. Damon Locks. All right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ah, how's everyone doing? Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. I am very excited to be here and talk to Ed. Um, one of the things I am interested in doing is finding out, like since we have the opportunity to talk to Ed, I want to talk to him about the work that he does, but I also want to talk to him about being an artist and how you make that happen and, and how he got to where he was today. Um, because it's the book fair, I tried to do something a little bit extra creative today, so I broke my questions up into and like... the sun in my eyes? Yeah, it is bright. Um, I tried to break my questions up into chapters. So I, I made chapter titles that are hip-hop or comic book related. So the first chapter is this. I like hot butter... Like, no, I'm like hot butter on my... Bre on, ugh, I'm like hot butter on your breakfast toast. Right. Right, okay. So that's comics, right? So <laughs> comics are like the hot butter on your breakfast toast. So comic books were at one point like a, a niche genre. And now we're finding that comic books like truly are the myths of this American culture, you know? Um, so, um, they're getting a format, they're getting uh, highlighted in, in, in ways that, as a comic book fan, I couldn't have imagined when I was a kid. Right. Um, what was your first experience with comics, and when did you know that you wanted to do them? I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I was born in 1982, and uh, the people who are around my age, a little older, a little younger, uh, we are the last vestige of the the corner store uh, newsstand comic book fan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically saying that I would go to the grocery store with mom, and there would be a couple of spinner racks at the grocery store, and I could just choose a couple Spider-Man comics, uh, X-Men comics, whatever they had. 
uh, you could almost be guaranteed to not be able to get two consecutive issues of anything. <laughs> exactly. Uh, because it was very sporadic. Um, but that was my introduction to, to the forum. Um, most people my age uh, would probably have, have this uh, similar answer. So I've always known comics. I, when I was a kid, there was definitely a stack that uh, I had that I didn't buy. It's almost like my dad was like preparing for me, like, you know, oh, kids read comic books. So, you know, while they were buying onesies and stuff, he was stacking up uh, some comics for, for the future uh, whenever I was, you know, old enough to start reading or whatever. Um, but always read comics. Um, it, reading the Marvel DC stuff, what was really cool about that was instantaneously, once you're uh, able to read, you see the credits page um, on the splash page uh, in the front of the book, and you could read that you know this story was written by Chris Claremont, drawn by John Byrne, uh, you know inked by Terry Austin. So exactly. that so good, so good. That uh, you know that created um, the idea that these things are not made by an elaborate computer algorithm. That uh, actual human beings are behind uh, these 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 works. And uh, from day one, uh, I never wanted to be, you know, a policeman or a fireman or something like that. Uh, it was always, always going to be comics for me. Mm -hmm. um, so once you knew that you were be a comic book artist, even as a young person, like what trajectory? Like, did you make a plan that you're like, this is how I'm going to do it? Yeah, the the, the goal because I was very, uh, I had a lot of self-awareness and I knew that my skills were weak. Um, I wasn't going to be one of these like outlier 14-year-old uh, cartoonist uh, wonder, wonder kid genius types, right? So in a lot of those Marvel comics, um, there would be an ad somewhere in the middle uh, for the Joe Kubert School of Comic Art and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was my goal for my entire childhood um, through high school to just build a strong portfolio that was uh, good enough to be able to gain entry into that that uh, that amazing institution. Uh, I would read a lot of articles about um, about the alumni of that school and how tough it was to get in there and how you really have have to uh, you know be on the ball. You can never be late with an assignment because they'll kick you the hell out. And I, I was preparing for all this stuff, you know, like putting together this big portfolio. And I got in, and uh, once I made it to campus, I'm looking around me. I was probably one of the younger people um, to ever go to the school because a lot of people would take a couple years off and maybe go to real university for a while or whatever. Um, but I quickly learned that you, if you have the money to, to afford to get in, they'll let you in. So what I'm saying is I was surrounded by a lot of knuckleheads. Mm -hmm. But that was your, that was your... My, my young, my young, you know, childhood, I, before that point, like working up to that point, um, I easily made a thousand comic book pages that, you know, will never see the light of day. Still have a bunch of them too. Um, and it would vary from making my own stories, which would be very, very, sm like, you know, four or five page things. Um, that were meant to be bigger comics, but after like three pages, I would get a better idea and just abandon that, go do something else. Um, all the way up to just com copying complete comic books. Like I drew, I copied the first issue of um, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns to just- So you, you copied, that was your a way of learning by copying the whole thing? Yeah, for sure. And I had my mother letter it because her hand lettering was nicer. And uh, when when she would like read the copy, she was she was like, laughing at Frank Miller, and I'm like, what are you, this is serious literature, lady. <laughs> you know, I almost like divorced my parents, like uh, Dominique Mochiano, the 1994 uh, gymnast uh, gold medalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, so, uh, about story, storytelling, yeah. comic book storytelling. Yes. Okay, so now, now we realize, as I said, like comic books are huge, you know, like, or the comic book world is huge, you know? Um, major motion pictures are like every year there's like 10 of them. Right. Um, what, what can comics do in storytelling that other formats can't do? Well, the, the, um, the marriage of words and pictures is, is 
you know, nothing, nothing to sneeze at. The ability to go back a couple of pages and kind of revisit some things uh, can be a storytelling component. You know, you could draw something that seemed incidental on one page, um, but it could have some payoff five pages later that makes you like go back or upon second reading, you're like, oh my goodness, this, this object was there the whole time. Um, there are, you know, there's, I mean, we could, we could talk about that all, all, all day for sure. It's, it's something I really like, the, the um, idea that you're seeing this whole unit at once is an interesting challenge to overcome because as a cartoonist, one of the big puzzles is trying to capture the reader's uh, attention and also their motives. So it's like you want to lead their eye in this specific way, and that's not easy to do. Um, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, like I said, my entire life has been uh, devoted to the art of making comics. Um, but, you know, if we were to be frank in our discussion, it's a tremendously uh, inefficient form of storytelling if, if we want to be honest about it. You know, like, the amount of time put in to each page um, and the yield that you receive in terms of, like, how long it takes to read mm -hmm. is very fast, right, you know. Right, right. Um, but, you know, it's the coolest. It, what, what I like about it most is uh, it's democratic. It's... it's it's, uh, you just need a pencil and paper to be able to do it. Um, you don't need a focus group. You don't need a lot of money to put uh, a comic together. Um, so the budget can be endless. You mentioned the, the Hollywood movies that have these like multi-hundred dollar budgets or whatever. Um, you know, the, to, do, to achieve the same effect in a comic, you just need the price of uh, pencil and paper. Right, right. And people can enjoy it for like, well, it used to be 35 cents. Yeah. And now it's like three dollars. Yeah, $4? You, you remember the, like the old danger of, of of comics when when you were reading those Marvel DC things um, was when you would get an issue and it would say still fifty cents because right. you know the very next issue that is going to be fifty five cents. Right. Exactly. Um, but I have a question about storytelling. Really. Yes. Um, is that something? Okay. So when I used to try to draw comics a long time ago. Um, I only wanted to draw like the fight sequences. Yeah. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't want to draw them sitting in their like fortress or driving in a car or sure. going to the grocery store, right? Yeah. But <laughs> the question is, is storytelling in the comic book form, is that something that you can learn or did you have already like an innate sense of how to put something together? Uh, I was talking with Gilbert Hernandez of the famous uh, Hernandez brothers who put together Love and Rockets, and I completely agree with what he said to me. And you know, he said that he he learned storytelling from guys like Jack Kirby, from looking at these mainstream comics. And um, you know, as human beings, we sort of have something in our brain that's kind of attuned to like pattern recognition and stuff like that. So on an intuitive sense, I think if you look at comics long enough, you kind of uh, intuitively figure out how they work. Um, and that's an advantage that we have uh, by reading those, those X-Men comics that are kind of put together by m many people and then it has to go to like a gatekeeper to like sign off before the, the lowly artist gets paid or however that works, you know? Um, and I think it can be learned. Um, the, the, the craft of drawing can be learned. You know, like when I went to that Kubert school, there was a guy who knew that, you know, on an ideal face, the, the width of the face is five eyeballs wide, right? And he knew how the clavicle fit into, like, the shoulder and all of this stuff. His work had no soul to it. You know, and that's the thing that is kind of in, like, you know, built in mm -hmm. that you really can't teach. Right. And that's the stuff that's very evident when you look at a lot of comics and you're just like, ugh, you know, right. soulless. Mm -hmm. you, it's very clear that the person is drawing it because, you know, they live in Brooklyn and they have to pay $3,000 a month and they have to, like, get this done to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things, uh, just to add my own personal curiosity, and luckily I can do, I can ask this question: um, How to draw comics the Marvel way? Did that have any impact? 
huge. Okay, because that, that book as a child, I ordered it and waited every single day <laughs> since the day I, like the, the check had not even arrived to them sure. and I was checking the mailbox for it. Yeah, that book, that book was in my elementary school library, you know, like when we were learning the Dewey Decimal System, you know, the first word I looked up was comics and that was the one book that, that we had and I would just take it out. I think, you know, in elementary school you just keep the book for a week, but I would just take it out week in, week out. And, and uh, not too long ago, I uh, visited that elementary school and they still have the same copy and it has some blemishes and imperfections that I put on there nice. and I remember putting them on there. Nice. Yeah, I had an eraser melt on it. Like my, our house was so hot and this, this eraser kind of like had uh, some sort of chemical reaction with whatever they binded the thing with that it just like melted a, a racer shape in it. Nice. That was me. That's hot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my next, cha next chapter of questions, right? Uh, yes, yes, y'all, and you don't stop, okay? Oh, these are the chapter titles. This is chapter titles, yeah, cool. you got it. Okay, so hip hop was uh, also something that whose relevance has grown over time. Yeah. Um, uh, like, like comics, it was like perceived as a, a niche of some sort. Right. Now has like grown to being like, like probably America's biggest export. You know, cultural export it could be. One it, of could them. Be, it could be argued, right? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, how long have you been listening to hip hop? Once again, that, that was something I was born into as well. Like, you know, the, the neighborhood that I that I grew up in was was um, you know it was predominantly black. One of the few, I was one of the few white white kids in the neighborhood, and there would just be you know guys walking up and down the street with with the uh, with the boombox that took like you know sixteen you know, C-cell batteries that to, to like last for, you know, one hour. Um, just playing like different kinds of music. My parents had um, had some disco anthologies that, that would have Curtis Blows the Breaks and the, you know, the Shaka Khan song with uh, the Melly Mel verse. Mm -hmm. um, I would hear this stuff constantly and that was the music that my friends would listen to. So I was kind of like a, a crowd clown. I'm just like, oh yes, I wanna hang out with you guys. What are you listening to? Um, I spent all my money on comics, um, so I would kind of give them those uh, Magnavox tapes to, to dub me, um, you know, their favorite stuff. And then, you know, I grew up through the era where on MTV, if you wanted to watch, if you wanted to see a rap music video, you had to watch UMTV raps. And then as I got a little bit older, um, that wasn't the case. Like the UMTV raps kind of became obsolete. It went away because you would be able to see rap music videos any second of the day. Um, so it was extremely popular at that time when it was, you know, it really hit its tipping point around then. Um, but I still kind of like did it wrong in a way because, you know, to like high school kids, uh, you can't listen to any music that, that was like six months old. It would be considered played out. Mm -hmm. And I would just keep digging back further. I had this impulse to just keep digging back further and you know, they were like, why are you listening, are you listening to that to old you? stuff? Like, right. my, that, my dad has a Grandmaster Flash record. Like, that's not cool, you know? Okay, so what made you decide that you were going to put these two loves together? For a really long time, I wanted to do some kind of comic using a lot of hip-hop imagery. A lot of my favorite kinds of hip-hop Im imagery. The fashion, graffiti, um, pre uh, Ed Koch, New York, like scary New York, like taxi driver type nice. mm -hmm. New York. Um, and I didn't know what the kind of MacGuffin of whatever this tale would be. Um, and then at a certain point I was just thinking, you know, when it comes to all the cartoonists that I know, uh, many are fans of rap music, but they could never beat me in a trivia contest. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. just the inherent knowledge of the records that I have um, is probably greater than most of, most cartoonists. And I have the willingness to do the homework to figure out the stuff I don't know. So, uh, so I just, all of a sudden was like, you know what, I'm just gonna make a very uh, straightforward, linear history of uh, rap music. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was off, off to the races. Now was this something that had been on your mind for a while? Like had you had, you had like, Tons of, tons of projects and tons of things that you've already done, but you were like, oh, I'm still gonna do this project. I'm gonna make it happen when I have this opening. Somebody sent me uh, an interview that I did in 2009 where I mentioned 
uh, wanting to do a history of, of hip hop. So it at least goes back that far. Um, I was actually surprised that I said that um, because I think it was probably just a frivolous conversation that I had with you know, a, a writer who I was very comfortable with mm -hmm. and I like spit that out, but I wasn't conscious of it mm -hmm. because I didn't start making the comic until 2012. Um, obviously, you know, I have, I have a lot of ideas. Um, and this one, uh, for whatever reason, just felt um, exciting to, uh, to explore at that moment. I, I uh, was posting these strips on a website called boingboing.net, which um, had a built-in audience of, I think, like five or six million readers per, per month or something. Um, so when I did my first you know, Hip Hop Family Tree strip, it, uh, you know, it went viral. Mm -hmm. you know, it, within a couple of hours, tens of thousands of people shared it on their Facebook accounts. It was retweeted you know, yeah. thousands of times. That's where I first saw it. Yeah, yeah that's cool, that's cool. And then, it, it, I don't know, there's just something about it that gave me an incentive to just keep it going. I was gonna do it semi-routinely but then I got like some kind of like some addiction that like oh I like all this attention I'm gonna keep it keep it rocking. All right, so like I have a question about structure or how do you go about like walking into this giant project? Like it, in some ways it reminds me of uh, the book Please Kill Me. Yeah. You know, like an oral Love history. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but how do you take an oral history? Like that's a format where you can like I, I'm gonna read this person said this person said and you can just organize it this way. So for me this idea of taking a genre of music which had tons and tons of people involved and try to create a, like a linear kind of path through it, what was, the, what was your process? Um, as I said, I, I put this work on uh, that Boing Boing website. They were goodly enough to um, allow me to post uh, a strip every week of almost any kind of comics that I felt like. And um, that was my motivation. Like, let me kind of fill this slot each week. So that was the exercise. Comics, it, for me, it's just, it starts as an exercise to just, uh, you know, let, test myself. And I wanted to see what it would be like to be a weekly cartoonist. And you know what, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that out the hard way. So it's like, all right, I gotta fill, fill some space. Every Tuesday I put out a, a new uh, strip. Um, and so, you know, I had this kind of format locked in, and thankfully, the history is fairly in stone, and uh, that gave me my kind of blueprint for, for how to format this thing. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I was going to do this strip semi-regularly, um, but as I started accumulating material for the first strip, I came across a lot of really visually interesting stuff that I thought would lend well to comics. Um, so I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna do another one. And then as I would flesh out you know, that moment, I would learn about something else. And it continued that way for four and a half years. Like I'm taking a little bit of a break right at this moment from it, um, but for four and a half years, that was the thing. I never uh, had any like lead time, you know, like I never had like a buffer. So it's like every single you just week, have to keep going for four and, and a half years uh, of just you know putting out a new new strip every Tuesday, you know, do two new pages of comics. Um, but even in that time, you know, I was like the the books came out, and I would be uh, on a book tour and traveling the world. So it's like I drew pages in Denmark and in uh, Norway, and it like <laughs> I was talking with with some friends, and and they were like, it's literally. They're like, man, it's like literally like being a rock star. I'm like, shut up, man. And they're like, no, man, because like a musician is expected to continue making music even when they're on tour, you know? And I was like, yeah, but at least those guys got private planes and stuff like that, man. I'm sitting in coach, like. <laughs> now, I assume, do you have like a, a regimen, like a thing that you, like the way you treat your, your work ethic? Do you have to draw X amount uh, a day or a week or a month or? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think uh, the more people you, you would talk to who, who would know me, they, like, I'm sort of known for, for my work ethic, you know? And, and, like, I have this keen ability to just say, you know, F everything, and I'm just going to get this thing done. Um, when I started 
the Hip Hop Family Tree comic, uh, a routine developed. You know, I knew that like, you know, Monday is like writing day. And that would consist of doing some interviews, researching, all that sort of stuff. Um, I would let all this information swirl in my head uh, for most of the day, and then basically by 1 a.m., um, you know, I would have some kind of eureka moment, like, okay, it's all coming, coming together, the comic will look like this. You know, uh, draw it in pencil for two days that week, uh, spend another couple days inking it, color it, uh, you know, in a day, and then it goes up the next day, wash, rinse, repeat 45 times, right. oh, uh, uh, you know, 45 times in a row, then I have enough material for a book, spend the rest, and then that would become like the most busy part of my year because I would spend the rest of the year designing that book, but also keeping the, the strips going in the meantime. You know, like the, like the covers take me a month to do, to just kind of like play, figure out all the possible angles and ideas and, and you know, design compositions. Um, yeah. How did you gain? I mean, Pittsburgh. Is there a, is there a big hip hop scene in Pittsburgh? It exists. Right. And now, so how did you gain access to people that you needed to interview for this book or for the strips? Yeah. Um, you know, when uh, when I was putting that first book together, uh, nobody would talk to me. Um, and then it became a New York Times bestseller. And then I started getting some phone calls. And it would be like, you know, pretty cool guys just like, listen, Ed, I just want to make sure you get my part right when it comes, when it comes down to it, man. Like, here's my number. And, and uh, you know, that was, that was really cool. Well, I, I was going to ask about that because, like, hip hop, uh, within, within the genre, especially, like, the golden era of hip hop, you know, uh, authenticity was a really big aspect of the genre, you know, like how authentic or how real. Yeah. Was that something that you had to like consider like transposing this into a comic book, like a comic theme? Did you have to figure out what authenticity meant to a hip hop comic? Right. I, I, I think I, I think I understand what you mean. Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, competing ideas about like this happened and that happened kind of thing. Um, so. As a for instance, in the first book, there are no less than three, at least three people who I give credit for creating the term hip hop. Because there's this camp who believes that this person did it, there's this camp who believes this person did it, so and so on. Um, there are many moments like that, uh, that that come up in the culture. And um, certainly as I began interviewing and like talking with more people, um, you would think that the work would, would, would get richer um, based on that, but one of the ways, you know, one of the, the necessary tropes of, of, of hip hop is like self-aggrandizement and um, destroying your enemies verbally. So, you know, there was like a lot of gossip and a lot of stuff like where I was like, you know, we're approaching seven billion people on this planet. Like, can, can I talk to like maybe one person on this globe who can corroborate this thing that you just told me? Right. Um, so I think I'm the, I was the perfect age to begin this comic when I did, because if I was, you know, 21 years old, uh, I would just be like, yes, sir, Mr. Bismarcky, whatever you say, like, you know, yes, sir, you know, whatever. Um, it would have been a different thing, and it would have been a big piece of crap. Uh, do you hear back from people that are in the book? Like, how do they feel about the book? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. maybe like Russell Simmons, has he contacted you? <laughs> yeah, he uh, he got his uh, his like president of uh, deaf um, deaf entertainment or something to, to to get in touch once, and and they have a bunch of projects in in the works, and I think they were trying to kind of like casually kind of get me to tone things down because he offered me these these jobs to like punch up scripts and stuff. And uh, if you're unfamiliar, like, like I, I draw Russell Simmons the way he kind of was when he was a young man, kind of, you know, used angel dust, has a severe lisp, had a kind of like wandering lazy eye. And, uh, you know, was, that was, uh, gave, gave him sort of a warts and all approach. Anyhow, when they got in touch with all that, that noise about, you know, doing this work with them, I still drew him the same way. And then they never called again. So I feel like they were like trying to like throw me some bones so that I would be like some kind of dork, like, okay, man, I don't want to mess up this opportunity uh, to work with Russell. But 
you know, whatever. But there's probably tons of people that are huge fans of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome um, to just kind of, you know, do a little vanity search on Twitter every now and again and then see, you know, that De La Soul, you know, retweets the thing. Or, um, you know, one of the most popular strips that, that I did was, um, it was because Ice Cube shared it um, on all of his social, social media uh, accounts. And what I liked about that moment was that um, it, was, it was a moment where Ice Cube met Dr. Dre for the first time uh, before they put together NWA. And the language that he used when he shared it, he kind of, he like took ownership of it. So he's like, yo, check out this comic about when I met Dr. when I met Dre. Okay. You know, he took ownership and, and you know, like millions of people uh, saw that thing thanks to him. That's amazing. Yeah, real cool. Okay. It's clobbering time, AKA Hulk smash. Okay. Um, now, Hip Hop Family Tree, doing fantastic. People love it. Ice Cube is retweeting about it. Um, how has this experience um, making the work and presenting it and having such a positive feedback on it, how has that like, affected and changed your world and as an artist and as a person? Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's taken me around the world and it's made me a worldly person. The, the book is in several languages and I get to go to the places where this stuff is translated and I get to meet the, 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 you know, the people of these other cultures who are absorbing the work for the first time. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I've created a, a sort of buffer for myself so that I can, um, so that I could think about what my next step will be. Like it, it, the, the books have made it possible for me to kind of design my career moving forward. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been positively life-changing in a lot of ways. I got to, you know, I got to collaborate with Public Enemy and like make some, some action figures, you yeah. know, and, and that's, yeah. that's my favorite uh, rap group ever, you know, um, so. And, and they played to the, tonight. Yeah, 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 we're showing our professionalism yeah. by not being over there right now. Yeah, <laughs> it was hard, it was hard. I went there, I went, I yeah. went, and I, I had the worst case scenario, the worst of all worlds for me. I saw the end of Living Color. Well, I, oh, I'm sorry. I apologize to Living Color, but I saw them doing a Clash cover, and they it, it was to me it was just terrible. It was horrible. And so then I saw all of the like sound check and setup for Public Enemy, and then had to come back. And as I was like three blocks away from it, I hear Chuck D's voice coming, and I was just like, "You're taunting me," you know. I tried hard. I'm a pro. I'm a, I tried for, like, I tried for both of us. Like, I was like, so we got to be here. We have to see it. And it just didn't make it, you know? Ugh, the world. We love you guys. Thanks for showing that, up. That's, that, yeah. There. For real. Um, uh, I was going to ask, oh, uh, when you look at your own work, yes. what's, what do you like best about it? And what is the most fun? I can tell you this. Uh, and it's taken me 32 years, basically, you know, 30 years to, uh, to be able to say that I think that I've, like, found my own voice. You know, the comics I make are Ed Piscor comics, and it was not that way for the first, you know, 30 years of my life. I would read uh, Love and Rockets and want to make comics like Jaime Hernandez, and I would read, you know, a Frank Miller comic and want to make a superhero comic like Frank Miller, right? So I think I found my voice, and I felt kind of like, found my, my, not my niche, but just who I am as an artist, and that's awesome. And just the, just the, the whole process of comics, of making comics, uh, is completely necessary. So I'm talking about even ruling the panel borders is, there's a part of it that's necessary, and it's all fun to me. It's like I get to basically meditate for, you know, eight, ten hours a day, and just kind of uh, go into myself, enter this almost zen-like state, and at the, at the end of the day, I have like a new comic page. And then after many days, I have a book's worth of stuff, and it's just like this very calming thing um, that's, you know, can't beat it. If I, uh, you know, was a kid traveling forward in time, looking at myself now, it's like I'm exactly in a position that I've been planning for basically my entire life. Which is super rare. 
I mean. What can I say? Yeah. I'm rare. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I noticed about your work that drew me to your work is that um, as a fan of both hip hop and a fan of comics, um, the way you approach making comics is, is that it appears that you love the form from top to bottom, yeah. from you know um, zipper tone to to making the the panels. You to know, to the, the Count Dante ads, man, yeah. in in uh, the nineteen seventies Marvel comics, with that guy with that crazy hair trying to sell his uh, his Ninja Academy. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I think is is super beautiful. How we did you? How, how we? Doing? We have five minutes. Oh, we have five minutes. Okay. So um, let me see. I think I have a, two more chapters. I mean, short chapters. Um, okay, uh, who the blank is this? Page me at 5.46 in the morning, crack a dawn, and now I'm yawning, and wipe the cold out of my eyes, see who's this paging me and why. Um, can you name some of the, your both comic book and hip hop heroes that you've been able to meet? Uh, Public Enemy. Uh, last weekend uh, was at this this comic event, SPX, and uh, my publisher is called Fanographics, and Fanographics uh, this year is celebrating their, their 40th uh, anniversary, and I specifically chose this publisher, one, because they gave me no kind of editorial feedback on anything, design, format, whatever, um, but also the pantheon of cartoonists who are under the Fanographics umbrella are like, you know, to bring up another uh, Olympic reference that is less obscure than Dominique Mociano, the 1992 uh, US basketball team, the dream team with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, right? So my, uh, the, my cartoonist heroes are like Dan Klaus. Oh, I don't wanna say heroes on camera because like I know these dudes and, and like, you know, hip hop isn't, doesn't work that way. But Klaus, Chris Ware, Charles Burns, um, Jessica Abel, Joe Sacco, these people who like I'm in the family. You know, that's the other like kind of cool thing is um, when I went to that event I mentioned, SPX, the first time, um, it was about 10 years ago, and Fanographics was cel celebrating their 30th anniversary. They were gonna have this big oral history book. It didn't happen for 10 years, so they actually got it together, put it together for the 40th anniversary, and how cool, because I get to be in it, right, right. you know? Yeah. Um, I see um, some look like comic fans, look like there's some young people, like this is a classic question, but like what advice would you give in terms of like making comics? Um, I think that it's, it's best to just be in it, into it for the right reasons. Um, just don't expect to make a lot of money up front. Do it for the love, do it almost for the tradition. Uh, do it because you can't not do it. And um, you have to be relentless. You have to almost uh, punt your teenage years away when all your friends are partying and smoking weed and having sex. Uh, you and if don't you're drawing, do that. don't do that. If you're drawing, uh, you know, don't worry about that. Like, you know, it, it pays off later or something like that. You know, what I mean, you, you, like you have to, you have to punt your teenage years and you have to punt your twenties, and then uh, you know, the rest of your life can be clear sailing. But it really takes, I, I have this idea that it takes like 20 years to get to be good enough to be publishable, and then it's gonna take another uh, 20 years to, to like create your masterpiece. Mm -hmm. You know, like I truly sort of believe that. So I'm on my tra trajectory, like I haven't done my masterpiece yet, but I keep learning, and I'm still a student. Like if any teenagers or whatever who are here, like I'm the same as you, I'm still learning stuff. It's just, I've been putting in, you know, a, little, a few more hours. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop, right? Awesome. All right, thanks, Ed. Th hey, thank, thank you, you guys. Thank everybody. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.